Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's panel discussion, Generating Social Capital and Unlocking the Creative Economy with NFTs. Today we're pleased to have three distinguished speakers with us on the panel, all of them connected by a mission to add positive values in society through arts and culture initiatives. To my left, we have um, Linda Donier, founder of Cyberbat, and we also have Fine Faswani, co-founder and managing partner of UMA, and also Jillian O. Howitt, um, the DAVA's co-founder and fair director. My name is Joyce and I am the program director of DAVA and also moderator for today's panel. Before we jump into the discussion, um, I would like to introduce each of the speakers so they can share a little bit on the background and give context to the sharing today. Um, Vinay, perhaps you can start with you. Yeah, sure. So hi everyone, I'm Vinay, uh, founder of UMA. UMA is a venture studio based between Hong Kong and Senegal. Um, we essentially build and back creator economy platforms um, by way of financial or human capital. Um, primarily across Francophone Africa, the creator economy and creative industry in general has uh, for a long time been very underrepresented and underfunded. We essentially work in pursuit of uh, commercializing work um, by creatives, uh, small scale businesses um, with the intention to, with the objective to scale them up into uh, backable uh, ventures. And to Linda, if you can share a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Linda. Apologies, I have a little bit of a cold so I'm going to sound uh, a bit muffled. Um, I am a Senegalese artist uh, and designer. Um, I uh, started in the NFT space about four, five months ago um, and have been fortunate to um, uh, have been able to found uh, Cyberbat, which is a DAO of artists, so a decentralized autonomous organization uh, bringing together artists of uh, African descent. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you, should I do that again a little bit louder? No, 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 yeah, that was good. Thank you. And and Jillian? Oh, hi, hi, everyone. I'm Jillian. Um, I'm the co-founder of Digital Art Fair. And uh, um, we founded Digital Art Fair last year with the ideas of, um, how do you say, bringing quality to, to the, to bring more, you know, bring a better, better economy for, for creative industry. That's what I would say when Dava first started. That's the, the goal. And uh, when I met Renee um, at uh, one of the talk that I was giving in, I don't know if you want color, like one of the one of the, the the members club was somewhere, and I met this gentleman, and I, he said to me, "Hey, I'm working on this project," and I said, "Oh, cool, tell me more." And and that's that's how we connected, and this is, and then a few months later, he's here, yeah, <laughs> and Linda is here. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, and I think um, everyone with us today, you've probably visited the bar bar shop at the fair, um, and a lot of visitors and audience actually come to me and tell me how fascinated yeah. by the project. Fine, would you be able to share with us how this all came about? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, January this year, it's we were kind of incubating like a generative art project, you know, just simply riding on the hype of NFTs and art, and it, that's really what it started with. It was just there's a lot of craze here and there's a lot of online value being generated. Let's jump into this. Uh, so with Pamplemousse from our team in Senegal, uh, um, creative artist, multidisciplinary, um, just creator in general, um, we started to conceptualize different types of projects, generative art, uh, pan-African like sort of co-creations, uh, leveraging, um, I guess, the borderless nature of NFTs. Um, and the ability to, uh, and its ability to, uh, you know, uh, facilitate partnership pretty easily. Um, as we were incubating these ideas um, and learning, really, uh, it became clear that it wasn't necessarily the chase for the online value, but more so figuring out with all of this online value, how does it translate to offline value um, uh, and social, true social utility. Um, in the communities that we work and engage with in Senegal and beyond. Um, and so that's what led to us uh, spinning off uh, our internal incubation into an NFT studio called Amazing, um, whereby we bring NFT projects, uh, 
periodically uh, to market. The projects have baked into their smart contracts uh, social utility. And what that means is um, whilst we might be transacting a digital asset, within the contract there are offline transactions that are geared towards um, accelerating um, startups, businesses, creatives, or just chat issues that we have, uh, we have sort of outlined and defined. Um, and um, yeah, trying to create this, uh, and that's really at the, we, we're at that nexus of um, digital art and social utility. Um, so the Baba Shop, which you can see here, oh, maybe if we go to the previous page. <laughs> so our flagship project, which is dropping in December, it's a collectible project called Baba Shop, um, conceived by Pam on our team. And here, uh, what you see here, this is an act, it's a generative art project. So um, you might not be able to see it super clearly, but all of these, what generative art really is, is it's a, it's, it's a, they're unique configurations of traits. And uh, as developers, we prescribe the rarity um, to those traits or through gamification, you know, rarity can be uh, defined. Um, though it is, a, it is simply a collectible uh, project, um, within our smart contracts, 20% of primary sales and 20% of royalties uh, go back to fund black hair care brands and barber shops in Senegal. Um, so whilst the collectibles might be purchased by um, you know, the community we build on our Discord and whatnot, really the, the 10,000 NFTs offline will, we hope, and we're, that's, a, that's on the roadmap, will actually um, boost uh, local businesses uh, in a meaningful way. Yeah, and also Linda, I know you're also involved in this project. Um, could you also share with us your involvement and why Baba Shop and why you know black hair? What's the significance of that? Yeah, absolutely. When uh, Vinay and Pam approached me with uh, this idea, I, I was immediately excited because um, so perceptions of beauty um, are very politicized, especially black beauty. Um, and it's often the domain of, um, uh, you know, a lot of conversations around what's uh, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's considered beautiful and what isn't. And um, this is to me a project that celebrates uh, natural hair, um, uh, natural black hair and, and sort of um, shows a new um, generation of young people growing up that it's, it is uh, beautiful to have textured hair and to, to be able to style it in all these different ways. But it's also a way to share sort of the, the culture of barbershops on the, uh, in Senegal and on the continent. It's always a place where you go to have, uh, to hang out, to have conversation around mental health, uh, to help each other out. And so sort of bringing that sort of atmosphere into the metaverse is, uh, is I, I thought was a really interesting uh, project. Thank you, and I think we have a few more slides on the Baba shop at Daba. Yeah, so these prints, uh, though this was uh, Linda, like all of us, just gathering and figuring out what we could do to this room. And uh, these prints, uh, these, uh, these are all um, wax prints. So these patterns are actually what's going to be um, uh, all of these unique prints are going to be on the NFTs as the clothing. Um, so uh, in this space, uh, it was just about to create that energy that Linda, that Linda uh, mentioned. Um, and to kind of just, um, uh, I guess, again, bring it offline. Like we didn't just yeah. want to have it on the screen. We wanted to, a, for people to kind of just indulge a little bit. It's a, it's a great installation. Yeah. So just furthermore from that, so you mentioned that Linda was uh, going to use this pattern on the NFT. Yeah. Um, so is, is who, who are the artists? Is Linda making all most of them? Yeah, so I mean with with Baba Shop, this one is uh, internally developed. So right. Linda, Pam and a few other creatives um, are working on the all the all the creative assets. Um, for our next flat for our next project, it's it's actually outward facing where we're engaging with individual artists from all 54 African countries to create one unified art piece. So yeah. it's just every project uh, engages with uh, artists both internally, externally, it just really depends on the nature of it. Mm. In general, um, and Linda definitely will uh, have a lot to say on this uh, with regards mm. to uh, 
the work she does via Cyberbot and her DAO. It's there's there's it's the first time like really Africa's uh, like African creative anything is on the level playing field to you know Western uh, infrastructure. That's not true. It's been really great. I feel like African art has been really really getting to the center stage slowly. So yeah, extra with this. I guess actually. it's it's that it's now on a level playing field for the artists. Like it's yeah that yeah it's, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. it's it's on a if you have an internet connection and you have the desire to learn, yeah. you can participate. Yeah. And and I think a part of like with no matter what you're doing on the ground with crypto and NFTs, there is an onboarding process and a right. community building right. process to, to bring on artists. Um, there's navigating a lot of that uh, know-how, which Linda definitely deals with first yeah. hand, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and also I remember, you know, Jillian, the first time you mentioned about this project, you were so mm. excited about it. You were talking yeah. about, you know, actually having a proper barber shop at the fair. You know, how did this, you know, idea came about? And you know, I guess art fair, you know, usually a lot of people think it's a commercial, yeah. very commercial driven, you know, yeah. by the art market. You know, would you be able to share some of your thoughts on why you would support this project? So, so yeah, this project came to me. Um, well, it's, it's a coincidence. But actually, I met you quite randomly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, not really. You were in a talk. We, we were talking about NFT uh, development in Hong Kong a few months before we launched Digital Art Fair. And I met Renee, and Renee was telling like we kind of got connected, and he was telling me that uh, also where are you from? I'm like what do you do? Uh, uh, why are you here for the NFT talk? And then he was explaining to me how he's connected to, to a group of artists, really great artists, and he showed me some of the artwork. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I think the reason that I said to uh, Renee, I said, why don't we do this in uh, digital art fair? Because first of all, uh, from my point of view as an art curator and an art dealer point of view is that African art is just something that is so cool mm. at the moment. Like after, I think one of the, 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 the attention that I got from it is from when Barack Obama and Michelle Obama had the White House uh, portrait made. And that really came to the center. So I was like, well, that is really cool. And in LA, in, in New York way now, everybody's craving for it. But of course, I, I do understand that it's difficult for most of the, the artists that is not in the West to, mm. to promote the work. And I thought to myself, this is a great cause. And, and Renee was telling me all this about this DAO thing that mm. I think we need to talk more about it later on because I'm still very new to it. And Linda will know more what is a DAO, what is a decentralized Promise. autonomous yes. organization yes. is about. Um, <laughs> Linda was <Yeah>. looking at yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think great project like this as a, as a fair, as an art fair. Um, digital art fair talk about decentralization, right? We talk about uh, bringing more uh, freedom to the artists, and I think the world is is most of the the crypto genesis, the people who are in the crypto world are really wanting to promote that decentralization is a part of uh, how the, the new community in the art scene moving forward, and people who collect NFT art are really focusing on bringing that into into discussion for for art collectors and institutions and artists and curators. So when I met Vinay, I said, we need to do this. Yeah. And um, it completely merged with my um, digital, digital affairs motto. Yeah. yeah. And I think the barbershop utilizes a really interesting model. And perhaps Linda could elaborate a little bit more on that <laughs> from a creator's perspective and how blockchain technology actually enables you know, more artists and creative to be involved. Yeah. Uh, so basically, um, I'm going to talk about sort of being an NFT artist as an independent artist and then what it means to be part of a DAO. Um, so from my perspective and, and just kind of my personal experience is that four months ago, five months ago, I was uh, working as a designer for uh, for a company um, and I was making art, digital art, um, as well as physical art. But I never thought there was going to be any avenue for digital art specifically to be consumed. Uh, for the most part, if you work as a designer, your work goes to your company and they commercialize it, right? Um, you create logos, you create identities, etc. cetera. Um, and then everything you do for fun just stays that way. And then I came across the NFT, um, NFT space on Twitter about a friend recommended to me and was fortunate enough to have an invitation to uh, a closed platform called Foundation. And then sort of the rest is history. Because after I minted my first um, digital artwork on there, 
I realized that this was complete freedom. I could market myself the way I wanted. I could share the type of art that I wanted. Um, I could create the kind of community that I wanted and even sort of find collectors who resonated with my work truly. And so kind of fast track to five months after that first um, um, very beautiful moment of minting my first artwork, I've sold over 200 NFTs. Wow. And it's it's just, yeah, it's, it's maddening to me. It's like, uh, I've had to explain to my family how it works because there's been a sudden influx of, of cash into the household and they don't understand why. <laughs> I, I think they still don't understand why, but I think there's something really uh, powerful about even um, how much has changed my life. Um, and I want to, to be able to share um, that experience with many, many people. I think there's more uh, talented artists, um, you know, younger artists, uh, even some, some, of the, some that are older that haven't found uh, their break yet. And I think the NFT space could be that for many people, could be the stepping stone to financial freedom, uh, but also just complete artistic freedom too, because there's really no one telling you what and what you, what you should mint or what you shouldn't mint. Um, yeah, so that's sort of my experience of the NSP, NFT space and why I'm so excited about bringing it to everyone that I know in Senegal. Um, and sort of uh, from there, I met a lot of um, incredible African artists on the blockchain and made uh, a ton of really important friendships to me. And then I realized that there wasn't really um, a sort of uh, a group working together of African creators um, in order to sort of uh, increase our, our um, financial autonomy in the space. So what you'll find in the space is that um, if you want to participate in some of the bigger projects, you need a lot of um, resources. And um, if, as an individual, it's you can wait and it might take you a few months to get to a place where you can participate in some of these more exciting projects. But if you bring your, um, your resources together and bring your talent together and bring your energies together in the form of a DAO, you're able to kind of participate in activities that you wouldn't be able to do on your own. So that's sort of what I'm, why I'm, I'm so excited about a DAO. It's, an, it's the ability to sort of come together and use uh, collaboration as a fuel for uh, sort of investing and uh, making the best, uh, the most out of the metaverse. So for example, investing, co-investing in uh, purchasing PFP projects that have uh, value, uh, co-investing to purchase art that we believe in and, and, and sort of keep in our vault, co-investing to create galleries and exhibitions um, and, and, and co-investing to sort of raise funds for specific purposes. So for example, one member of the CyberBot DAO is currently raising uh, funds for Eritrean refugees in Libya. She wants to buy art supplies for, for kids so that they can still have a childhood uh, while being in a refugee camp. So projects like that, just uh, throughout our collective, uh, you hear all kinds of amazing ideas. And by being together, we're able to start funding those without having to ask for grants or money from anywhere. Just by being together, we're able to sort of collectively generate the funds necessary to make those things happen. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Linda. And also, Fine, um, at the NFT studio, you also in, are involved in a number of projects utilizing blockchain and NFT. You know, how about, you know, in your field of work, are there other projects that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, uh, there. so with, with amazing um or if we even just take a step back for a second for creators on the ground uh across the value like ip or i mean you don't even have to look at ip you take like the chocolate we eat like what 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 the farmers in ghana are paid versus what ultimately margins hershey's books are two very are two staggering numbers and if you parallel that value chain uh, for creatives and IP in general be it film music f fashion whatever it is um, definitely you will see uh, it skews off the continent than on the continent um, with NFTs you can place your ownership your royalties right from the get-go um, and so you're secured in the value of your work, be it the current value or the future value or who, how many of our hands it's going to pass. And that's really important for the African creator economy, simply because 
if I'm if I'm if I'm a musician in Nigeria signed by a label in the U.S., uh, I go into a problem with my catalog. The lawyers accessible to me are in Nigeria. You're dealing with jurisdiction problems, contractual, navigating all those challenges. Really, really tough. Um, moving art in general or logistics is extremely difficult uh, on the ground. Uh, you always have to go via an intermediary or several layers of people before you're actually dealing with the end customer or the end buyer or the fan or whoever it is. Um, so in general, uh, we see applications in all forms of IP, uh, to, to come back to your question. Um, in the case of music uh, or in the case of film in particular, like there's there's the ability beyond just ownership and IP, which is the almost like the obvious uh, value add. It's it's the engagement um, and understanding um, you have with your fans or the people that actually want to like that are actually um, indulging in your creation. Uh, with a with a film project we're working on in Nigeria, it's an animation feature film. Uh, we've we've had conversations with the a range of like standard industry uh, players um, but it's a waiting game and we're we're not in control um, of, of the narrative so what we're pivoting to now it's it's a it's an animation on rats like Nigeria it's a Nigerian uh, it, it's a it's about a Nigerian rat that wants to make it in Nollywood so it's so we're looking to kind of tokenize the project a little bit and um, Part of the utility, for example, could be, oh, by purchasing this, this token, you could like name one of the characters, or you could yeah. choose uh, what, what direction this small, like what line this person would say here. Like just small things like that, uh, that number one, you're just engaging with people that are interested in the nature of your project and all of that. But number two, it's the power is now back with us. Like we were not, it's not a waiting game to find the studio or, 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 or find the right funding partner. It's, it's, it's saying we want to go ahead with this project with or without, yeah. with or without you, um, and so that's that. The, there are beyond the art itself. Like yeah. we're seeing it with film right away, uh, in, and and that's like a, there's fundraising utility and all of that with uh, with the example I just gave, um, and I think in general, um, what 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 I see for the different uh, types of creators we work with is. Um, they're, they themselves are like opening up, uh, I guess, their own definitions of their art. Um, and what I mean by that, it's like with a beat with uh, this collective of beat makers we work with in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, they've like visualized their beats and now they're creating digital art and it's attached to, it, it's completely like just elevated their, their brand, the positioning of their studio and whatnot. So I think everyone's in this phase of exploration, but is ultimately finding and creating value. So, so interesting, and there's so much potential for an alternative model. And Jillian, how about for DAFA? You know, DAFA is so different, you know, from the traditional art fair. You know, mm -hmm. would you be able to share with us your thoughts behind that? I think first of all, I, I like to I like to say um, I'm still learning from the decentralized decentralized world and and how how much impact the NFT have done to all the artists and the creative industry is just the beginning, right? Like, I mean, everything that Linda was just saying and, and when they were just saying, I, I'm still taking notes, I'm having mental notes and, and real notes as well. And yesterday we have Pupano to talk about it. And, and it's a very completely new market, right? Like, how can you have a project and have no funding? You just go online and say, hey, anyone want to pay, buy a token and help me out with my project? And it used to be fundraising, kind of like similar to fundraising. But now with NFT and DAO, it actually is possible. And a lot of the project that Linda was saying, you probably be dreamt about 10 years ago. Anyone want to start a project, there's no chance, zero chance that you can just do a film with whatever and then you tokenize it and go online and someone will say, yeah, sure, I'll give you some money. But NFT really changing the world in that case. When I first started digital art fair, going back to digital art fair is, is a crazy idea and thinking that people would actually want to go online and, and, and be engaged with the online community and talk to each other um, on Twitter or on, on, on Discord. 
it, but but it's, it's actually happening, right? So so along the way, I think I'm still learning more and more from different art community that I wouldn't be able to do that in in previously. Mm. I'll give you an example, right? I used to manage uh, international galleries, international museums. The only people that I dealt with are either my directors, right, the owner of the gallery or the owner of the museum, because I'm I was a manager, or I was a director. I never dealt with artists. I would never speak to them. I'm, I'm, I, I run, I'm a gallerist, I'm an artist. Only when I become an independent art curator, I start talking to artists. And then from that, and only when I start doing DAFA, I speak to the artists and the curators. And actually speaking to Linda, who is in Senegal, it was impossible back then. Like there was no chance, no chance, zero chance that you would talk to an artist directly and ask her, hey, what's your art about? And with NFT, it, it is possible. And I'm actually having a conversation with Linda right now that it just seems to be like completely, completely revolutionized the art world. Because think about it, right? Like used to, if you want to buy Banksy, let's just say Banksy, I like to use it because everybody likes Banksy. You buy Banksy, you never speak to him, ever, 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 right? But Linda, I was like, hey, Linda, can I speak to you about this? Can you commission this artwork? Who knows Linda work might go to a million dollars next year, like considering the rate that you're selling NFT right now. <laughs> but then it makes people, technology people seems to think that is pulling people apart, but in fact it's not. It's putting you closer to each mm -hmm. other, to the creative industry. And I think digital art fair as what we're doing right now, um, it's really giving the artists a place and a chance and the curatives and even the art collectors and the galleries to look at the art world in a different model instead of just here's a product, you buy it and then I might not switch here for it again, <laughs> you know, so I, we want to change that. Yeah, I think that's super interesting how, you know, um, blockchain, NFT and technology is actually disrupting the hierarchy of institutions. Um, what about the role of a curator or the notion of curation? Um, Linda, perhaps you could share with us um, your thoughts because you're also an artist and now also curating because of NFT and blockchain platforms. Yeah, um, one of the most exciting, um, I guess, trends in the NFT space is that more and more artists are starting to curate. Um, and um, with the advent of things like on cyber, Decentraland, uh, crypto voxels, you can actually create your own gallery, your own museum, and uh, fit it out in the way you want and put the artists that, and sort of curate your own exhibitions in the metaverse. Um, I started curating as a way to share the power and the beauty of uh, art from creators of African descent um, and sort of just sort of fell in love with doing the, with the process of doing that because in my mind curation is sort of something that is only uh, you know uh, the realm of curators and gallerists um, but in the metaverse I, I sort of got the courage to be like you know what I think I can take a pass at this and it's and it's a fun experience for me because it allows me to discover new artists um, and co and communicate with them and sort of create community in that way. But it also allows me to share my platform with them. So if I curate an exhibition uh, to my following, then they're getting to know new artists that they might not have known previously. And sort of I'm, I'm able to sort of uh, share my my following in this way and increase exposure to artists who are just starting in the NFT space. So that's something I'm really, really passionate about doing. Um, one thing I want to start doing a bit more is curating art by African uh, women, uh, African women who make art, and uh, I'm really excited about sort of creating, uh, um, curating something between now and the end of the year that sort of brings uh, brings that together. And and obviously, curation doesn't have to be; it can be as different as the person sort of doing the work, right? So. Uh, some people are curating based on genres. Some some people are curating based on the time of the uh, the timing of the artwork within the history of the NFT space. Some people curate based on identity of the creator. There's like there's so many different ways to go about this in the metaverse, and it's been ex it's been exciting to see more and more artists uh, venture venture into curation. Yeah, and Jillian, you also previously mentioned the changing dynamics between the artist and the collector. How about, you know, for audiences or institutions, you know, what's the change in terms of the dynamics? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, wow, I, 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 I can talk about this for a very long time, but I'm trying to keep it short. So, okay, so traditionally, I would say that 
I take the artist's artwork and then I take his artwork and I talk to the kid, talk to the art collectors and I tell them, hey, this art piece is really great because of this and because of this and because of this and this is uh, about half a million dollars. There you go. And, uh, and the galleries tends to look at it and um, as a product, like as I mentioned earlier, as a product, here's what it is, this is a transaction, and obviously you will keep a, keep a relationship with them, but very rarely it involves the artist, right? So, so that's um, one major problem for the creator because you don't really have uh, involvement during the whole process. You might have some, process, some involvement in the, in the exhibition setting, but after that you really, you really don't have much say in the gallery setting, unfortunately. Um, that's obviously is good for some artists because some of them do not is not probably not a client facing person, but there are a lot of them actually would like to be involved. But because of the hierarchy of the international art world, um, artists are not really be, be become a part of the of the create creative process mm. or that the transaction process afterwards, right? So with NFT, I'm not saying all artists prefer going on the NFT, some might still prefer the traditional way, some will represent them and you know, co control the, the, the uh, how do you say, demand and control, like how many supply you go on the market, price, etc. But the problem with this gallery, traditional gallery setting is um, actually limiting how many artists will be able to represent themselves. What I'm saying is, if I want a gallery space, which uh, I did, I have six shows a year. Yeah, I only have six shows a year because of the production time and cost to, to create a show, logistic, etc. One show lasts for one and a half month and there are two weeks this installation and this installation. So one year I can do six artists, right? There's no I can't do any more because that's the limit of it. But with NFT, right, like you can do as many as you want or an artist can actually do it by themselves. So that helps artists massively. Third is if I only have six shows a year, right? I can only do six shows a year. Of course, I'm going to choose the best selling artists because I need to pay rent. I need to hire staff. I need to pay for logistic, uh, promotion, marketing, etc. Right? Of course, I'm going to choose six of the best artists, but then the six of the best artists might not be living artists. They could be some artists that have been passed or like some blue chip artists that I've been working with because they make me the most money. Because the problem with the comeback is it because it's a commercial setting, right? Completely commercial. I don't, like so, I need to make decision that is going to be beneficial for a commercial world. So at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't be selling any living artists. I would go sell more Banksy or sell more I don't know Andy Warhol or sell more uh, Murakami because the price been pushing up and up and up. And as and then I would do that. And the other other galleries that sees what I'm doing. We sell Murakami as well because every sell Murakami, the price go up. Everybody's happy, and the auction house also sell Murakami because everybody's selling it, high demand. No one promoting young artists. Then at the end of the day, the problem is the creative industry is the pool is getting smaller and smaller. Young artists will not get a chance to be represented, and with NFT, I'm not saying that all the artists would like to go to NFT, but it gives young artists and young creatives a chance to at least be included in the process. And maybe they sell really well on the NFT platform or digital platform. Then in the end, a gallery will actually look at them and say, you know what, your work is really worth looking at and I will put a show for you. So yeah, I think that is the, the transitioning from how digital art can empower younger artists and kind of like, you know, disrupt the traditional art world a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing on that. Um, so, so we're talking about how, you know, NFT and blockchain can actually give power to the artist. Um, Linda, you know, there are so many artist-led platforms out there, you know, physically. Um, what's the difference between artist-led platform in the in NFT space comparing to physical sort of artist-led platforms and initiatives? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you repeat? Yeah, so with the artist-led platforms, um, we're talking about how NFT and blockchain is really enabling artists to have the power to, you know, and the um, autonomy to drive their own sales, you know, create their own artwork. Um, what's the difference between physical artist-led platforms comparing to those in the NFT space? So, um, Basically, the difference between artist collective or artist platforms in the physical world versus in the metaverse. Yes. 
Okay. Um, I I can speak to the one to the sort of the advantages of being in the metaverse. I think um, one is you're able to share um, yourself only as much as you you find um, appropriate or necessary. So what you'll find is that a lot of artists are coming in uh, to be anonymous, for instance, or they're kind of only sharing a little bit about their identities. Uh, for some, it's a way to feel safe, depending on kind of what identity you're bringing forward into the metaverse. So, uh, for instance, artists who are typically marginalized in the in the traditional art world can find comfort in the metaverse um, um, by sort of uh, sharing just as much of uh, about their identity as they feel comfortable doing. So I think that's that's always a very good advantage from a sort of human perspective. The second thing is that um, com collaboration and community in the metaverse is um, it, it's a it's a huge indicator of success. Uh, any artist who's not connected to other artists, who's not helping other artists, who's not involved in like promoting other artists and, and working together and collaborating, etc., is typically not going to do very well in the metaverse because it's such a um, it, it rewards solidarity, it rewards community, it rewards mutualism, which I think is not necessarily, you know, it's, it's always an advantage to do that in the, in the, in the physical world, but it's, but it's never necessary in order to succeed. If you're represented by the right gallery, by the right person, you don't necessarily have to work with others. But in the metaverse, you have to. Uh, you know, and, and there's been many stories of, uh, of people who've been uh, shunned by the community for, for sort of being too individualistic and, and moving um, too much to the detriment of other people. And so being in the metaverse definitely means you have to be a community builder first and foremost, and that's a huge determining of your, uh, determinant of your success. Um, and then finally, I think um, there's just the, the, the ability to draft your own smart contract. I think one of the biggest uh, difference that you find it, uh, between sort of uh, physical art sales and metaverse art sales is that there's a social contract that's hard coded that's backing every NFT. That's not necessarily true for for a, phys a physical painting or an art piece that you're selling in in a gallery, right? So, what happens is through that smart contract you can determine the percentage of art of uh, you're going to be making off of every secondary sale moving forward. Right. So even if your artwork is sold at a at a and you're undervalued the first time it's sold. So let's say, you know, you were grossly or criminally undervalued and it was bought for really cheap, but it was resold for for a much higher amount later. You still stand to make a revenue from that. And I think that's such an important part of uh, ensuring artists continue to get value off of their work even after it's it's sort of left their hand and and, and and as it's exchanging hands they're still able to make to make a, a revenue off of it which in the traditional world is very very difficult to do yeah thank you and then um, earlier we also touched on you know how you know it's really difficult to get funding and support for projects especially you know art or non project non-profit initiatives um, Linda would you be able to share a little bit more on that and how a DAO actually enables artists to support themselves we touched on that a little bit but maybe you can elaborate on that yeah there's different kinds of DAOs so I'll speak specifically to uh, uh, the DAO that I contributed uh, to creating, which is called Cyberbot. Um, and essentially, it's an artist DAO. There's different kinds of DAO. Ours is an artist DAO. So what we do is uh, a few things. So the first one is organize um, physical NFT shows uh, throughout the continent. We, we had our first in, um, in Senegal uh, a couple of months back. And essentially what we are trying to do through that is to increase the exposure of people on the continent to NFTs. It's really difficult to explain an NFT to someone, but it's not difficult to show art. And, and so through this sort of, um, through the connection, the emotional connection with the artwork, we aim to sort of have, start a conversation about NFTs and, and how they're not so complicated once you're able to sort of uh, grab, uh, grasp uh, uh, the art the art aspect of it. So that's one. The second thing we do is that we are um, looking to uh, sort of bring our resources together to start collecting work by uh, other uh, African artists uh, or creators of African descent in the metaverse. And the idea is to raise the floor for, for creators of African descent. 
So what happens in the traditional art world is that the floor for um, artists from, you know, third world countries, uh, global south, etc., um, is always generally lower than, you know, uh, the floor for artists who are, uh, you know, from uh, notorious uh, art institutions, uh, etc., who are backed by galleries, etc., etc. So what we're trying to do in the metaverse is say, we don't have to follow this trend. We can collectively raise the floor of these artists by pooling our resources together and co-investing in their work. So when you have multiple people purchasing one piece of artwork, they're able to purchase it for much higher than what the piece of artwork is valued as. So as, as we're doing that, we're raising the floor for each artist. So their, their value in the metaverse is going up, which is a strategy for us to say, the artwork from the continent is just as valuable as artwork from anywhere else. And this is how we're proving that. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, one of the things we're doing, I mean, just uh, there's a, a bunch of other things we're doing, but this is sort of th three of our pillars, um, is to start uh, raising funding for ambitious projects that wouldn't be funded otherwise. So for, exa for instance, um, this project about uh, purchasing art supplies for refugees, um, uh, Eritrean refugees, or uh, maybe an artist wants to take a three month sabbatical and explore um, image making and um, uh, sorry, my dogs are going well <laughs> and cryptography in Timbuktu. Um, we would be able to raise that funding in a very short amount of time and give it to them to then pursue this project. So that's sort of uh, the three pillars of, uh, of Cyberbot at the moment. Yeah, and Fine, do you have anything to add to that in terms of economic incentives for artists? Yeah, I mean. Ultimately, you're earning, like your revenue is now in a currency um, that is truly global. Um, when you generate, you know, your sales and you Naira hits your bank in Nigeria or Seifa in Senegal, if you then want to go transact simply even on Amazon, it's like a, it's a, it's it can be a massive pain. Forex is super. Uh, challenging um, and inconsistent to secure, or like the like rates can be ridiculous, uh, mm -hmm. or access to forex is always fluctuating. So suddenly, you're not only are you generating income, uh, more income, you're generating it in a currency that allows you to partake in this whole other global economy, uh, be it like fixed income structured products, or investing into art, or land in the metaverse, whatever it might be. Uh, that economic empowerment just by way of global currency, Ethereum or whatever it might be, is extremely liberating um, and empowering. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and I guess um, maybe, I think I'm sure a lot of the audience would like to learn more about the concept of DAO. And Linda, would you be able to break it down for us? You know, in very simple terms, how do we set up a DAO? You know, what it is, you know, bullet points. <laughs> That's really <laughs> tall order, but let's try. Um, okay, so decentralized autonomous organization. It's basically the equivalent of um, how do you create a company or a structure into the metaverse. And so DAOs work using smart contract as well. So what, what you essentially have to do is uh, find a group of people who align on certain values or who um, sh share a common understanding of something you want to do together. Um, and it could be anything, right? There, there are DAOs who invest together. There are DAOs who collect art together. There's all kinds of DAOs. So you have to figure out what you want to do as, an, like, as, the first, um, as the first thing. Then you have to build community around that. And once you have that community, then you can uh, create what's called a multi-sig account. So basically create your own um, little uh, account that brings, us, brings you all together. And then uh, within that, you start, you're starting to build your smart contract. So you can assign different voting, um, uh, uh, voting power to different people. So, you know, DAOs are meant to be flat. So technically there's no like uh, founder, leader and, and everyone sort of, it's, it's, not a, it's not a top down approach, it's a flat approach. So through the voting power, you're able to say, uh, um, based on the effort you're putting into the DAO, you're allowed to make decisions, right? So you, you, that's how you're, you're expending essentially voting power. So then you can vote on decisions together. So for example, if say you wanna invest in something together, someone proposes like, hey, 
uh, this is a really good way for us to invest so and so amount that we have. Uh, they submit it to the votes to the DAO, and then everyone in the DAO comes in and makes a decision. So everyone votes. Uh, so based on the majority, then the decision passes. If the majority isn't met, the decision the decision doesn't pass, etc. So it's it's a very sort of democratic uh, and flat hierarchy. Um, so it's it's a little different than a regular company in uh, that we're used to. Um, but it sort of functions in the same way in that it has goals, it has objectives, it has a vision, it has a mission. Um, it's just the way to get there is slightly different. It's through collaboration, through solidarity, through mutualism, and through sort of democratic power. Yeah, thank you. And I guess um, we will move on to Q&A as we have quite a few questions. Um, from Elena, thank you for the exciting project. Do you come across any legal problems on the IP laws or security regulations? I'm afraid it can stop this incredible freedom dynamic we are also driven towards. Um, Fine, perhaps? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, definitely. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's a huge... Uh, it, it's tricky to navigate. I guess if everything is staying on the metaverse, it's fine, but the second you want to, you know, actually convert to fiat, then it becomes a, a slight question, a slight question mark. Um, Hong Kong is Hong Kong is is a pretty fair jurisdiction for for most of our projects at the moment, and that's uh, been treating us well. But definitely, um, I, for and Linda and I have had this conversation as well with the artists that we engage with and collaborate with. Uh, what is the conversation, okay, you're generating all this Ethereum, but if you want to pay rent in Dakar, Senegal, what does that look like? You know, how does that actually happen? How does the money get there? And it then becomes a little, it definitely is challenging uh, until um, banking institutions uh, don't embrace it. There is definitely a, an undeniable roadblock to, um, capturing that uh, value in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, but it's increasingly becoming more and more doable, just like simple by way of PayPal or all of these things like, you know, you can still transact and buy a lot of things, but there are ultimately, at some point you just do need cash in your bank to do something that you need locally. That is a, that, that is a reality. Um, but yeah, for us that's really been, that, that, that line item is really where the, the challenge is. It's the, it's the conversion. Um, mm. Yeah, and then another question is, um, what are the biggest issues in setting up a DAO? Um, perhaps, um, uh, Linda? Yeah, um, I mean, with every flat structure, you, um, you have to realize it's, it's, a very, it's very difficult to make it work if not every, if all the individuals involved do not have a do not share common values or are not aligned on the same objectives. So I think one of the biggest things, uh, one of the most difficult things to do in the beginning is to make that object, um, make that vision clear and make sure everyone is aligned on the how as well as the what. Um, and to ensure that when it, when it comes down to making decisions, um, people are uh, working with the same amount of information. So you will see with a DAO that not everyone is going to attend all the meetings. People are in and out. You're allowed to sort of uh, take a take a step back, come back in, etc. And when it comes to making decisions, if you've missed, uh, you know, a couple weeks of important information, and if there's no way to share that information with the group in an asynchronous way, uh, you're coming in with less information than the rest of the group, and therefore you're not able to make a decision at the same, uh, in the same, uh, with the same ease and comfort. Um, and so a lot of DAOs are, fa are facing this communication tends to be one of the biggest issues, communicating uh, goals, communicating objectives, communicating values. Um, and then uh, secondhand is uh, just legalizing the structure. Um, it's, a, it's a huge gray area at the moment. Uh, and it involves a lot of gymnastics uh, that I haven't even started getting into. Uh, there's a lot of people who are much more... Um, knowledgeable about how to but it, it, it's definitely jumping through many many hoops and it, it's also varies from country to country so um that is definitely one of the two of the biggest challenges uh, that i've seen so far yep. and do we have any questions in the audience yes we do do we have um i guess with any 
anything new, like in any hype market, and because there's no barrier to entry, um, there must be a lot. Like there are a lot of people creating NFTs. There are a lot, like I went on OpenSea the other day and I didn't even know where to begin. How do you market yourself in the metaverse? And how do you, what is that discovery platform look like? How do you make sure like it, in your upcoming Baba Shop drop, how are you making sure that people are paying attention, seeing you, listening to your cause? Um, and for like metaverse newbies in the audience, how should we discover these things? Linda, do you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it does know. feel like walking into like the darkness the first time you walk into NFTs. Yeah. It's just there is so much and um, I think one of the ways that I thought about it that was really helpful is um, find communities that you identify with. So, for example, when I first walked into NFTs, I, I was like, you know what, I'm going to first look for black NFT art. I'm going to look for African NFT art. I'm going to look for women, diverse NFT art and sort of by kind of curating my feed to those first to those communities first and creating meaningful relationships within those communities i, st I started feeling more and more comfortable branching out um and um so yeah i think like one of the my best tip for how to start is to find communities you identify with or artists you identify with or you you'd like to collect from and then use that as a jumping point for creating relationships it's really not about how do you market yourself the question i think in the metaverse is how do you build community and through that marketing happens sort of as a um it happens naturally uh the more you know people the more you engage with people the more you share of yourself and your uh, you build those relationships the more visibility there is on your artwork but it's really not about marketing in fact if you're if you're a hardcore marketer in the metaverse people tend to be very distrustful of that mm, thank you um anyone think, else? just piggybacking off of that i think one thing that we've learned even in putting together baba shop and it is exactly it, it's not about the narrative, it's actually, it's like putting together a roadmap, like what's the journey we're going to go on together. And, and it's, it's less about graphics and whatever, it's like bullet points, but like this is what we actually want to achieve. Like it, it's really about the intent rather than the fluff around it um, in building a community with shared values. Um, uh, yeah. That's, uh, that was a very interesting takeaway as someone that is more hardcore marketing. Uh, have faith in actually what you want to do and connect to the people that connect and like engage with the people that uh, are based on shared ideas mm. rather than likes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. And anyone else in the audience? If not, we actually have quite a few more online, actually. Um, so following on that, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of creators are involved in the metaverse, but perhaps not so much in terms of collectors or like art lover communities or audiences. You know, what is the significance in that? And how do you think we can bring these people into the metaverse faster? You know, how do we enable them or share with them how, you know, how do we in involve them in the metaverse? You mean and, traditional and collectors? Yeah, traditional collectors of audiences that are not on the metaverse or maybe not, do not have that, um, sort of have not tried NFT, metaverse, or all that. Digital before. warfare. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, a lot of the, so can I answer this? Yes. Because what we're doing right now, right, is really about education where right? you like the reason that we do a lot of seminars and webinars and uh, is to to let people know what is going on because i think nft is such a such a new word to to a lot of us mm. and even for myself i am learning from linda i'm learning from Monet, i'm learning from all the artists like some of the artists been in the space for one year i think maximum and then some of them six months some of them two months it's a very very new concept so it takes, it's like any new technology that comes into place needs education and with that platform to educate this uh, collectors or, or new artists that they don't know what to do and right so digital offers goal is really just to bring this into the center of attention 
And I, I know from my experience of London's Fair for the last two, one, one, 10 days, the art collection is really excited. Like even in, in Hong Kong, I literally have like five phone calls from London calling me like before I jumped in here. I say, can I buy some NFT? How do I buy it? What should I do, right? Like these are people that are really looking forward to, to collect some NFT art. And uh, I think, I hope Digital Art Fair will be able to, to help the collectors and, and artists to learn more about how to get into the space and DAO also. Mm, yeah. And to follow on that, um, what do you think, you know, how can we bridge the physical world and the metaverse in terms of art purchasing or art appreciation? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to answer that, Joyce? Oh. <laughs> um, well, I guess, you know, at the Digital Art Fair, we have, you know, we're trying to engage audience in a way that we're introducing, we're introducing them into the metaphors. You know, we yeah. have all these VR experience and, um, and then we have the different, you know, how we display the different digital art that's mm. also trying to, I think the, you know, main concept is to bridge the physical and the digital. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, like you said, you know, we're a great platform to educate the public and to show them, you know, how it can be done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah and I think it's, in fact, it's like technology doesn't, you know, a lot of people think that with new technology, a lot of people, oh my God, like AI and computer and, and, and blockchain and just pulling people away from reality. But in fact, if you look at like the conversation that we're having right now, right, we actually, being able to talk to Linda, we can talk to anyone on Discord, and then you can have a phone call and follow a WhatsApp, and then you actually have a video chat with them. You actually bring people together closer than pulling them apart. So it's always been the case, I, I believe, it's always been the case of technology, is bringing people together, stream life, your life, and make it easier for, for a lot of different industries as well. So I hope um, people get I can understand it a little bit better through our conversation or or you know, like, I, and maybe you can chat with the artists online. You can follow them. You can go mm. on this Discord channel. You can go to the DAO with Linda, and you know, like, it's much more. It can bring information um, much easier across across the globe. Yeah. I mean, like, with all the cyberbot artists that are available for purchase at the show, mm. just the idea of having like ten different like bios and countries, and I mean we had so many nuanced conversations about Africa, which yeah. like we don't really have to like, that's not a, it, it, our, our uh, Hong, like in Hong Kong at least, like our, our understanding of the region is, is still like pretty removed. Um, uh, that for me is like incredible offline impact by way of NFTs and all of that great, mm. but a bunch of people walking away with like an alter, like an, uh, a more nuanced perspective of the region, um, a different image of the region. That's that's offline utility. Uh, the, and whether they buy the art, whether that person bought the art or not, they're still taking away some yeah. part of the idea that was within that piece uh, um, or within that artist profile. So uh, for me, that was a massive. Yeah. Uh, Offline, <laughs> I need to stop using the word utility, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, yeah, that, that was just really nice. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess also from uh, for Linda, you know, you mentioned the Metaverse Gallery that, that you guys are working on, plus a physical show. I guess that would also definitely bridge the physical and the digital. Do you have anything to add to that point? Yeah, so the first uh, show we did was uh, a physical, so we had a physical space in Dakar where we showed the artwork. We had a VR gallery where people could walk through and experience the art uh, and talk to each other. We also had uh, a sort of, um, uh, not VR, but um, <clears throat> less, I guess, less interactive VR, just to be able to see all the different artworks. Um, and then we obviously had DAFA kind of tag along uh, after after that, uh, and we were able to showcase some of the artists through DAFA as well. Um, and um, really, I think one of the main main reasons why we want to bridge the physical and the metaverse for us is to 
um, to show people on the continent the possibilities that NFTs um, are able to create. Again, I, I, I think I've said this earlier, but once you see the art, it's so much easier to understand um, mm. because it's, it's unlike anything you've seen before. You can have an emotional connection to it. And once you have that emotional connection to it, it's easier to talk to you about how it works uh, rather than sort of do the opposite of explaining to you how NFTs work and then convincing you to buy art. Um, and then another thing that we're, we're uh, attempting to do is also to show that investing in African artists is that it's an investment, it's not a donation. You're not making a donation, uh, you're actually investing into someone who, who has a really bright future ahead. All the artists in Cyberbot have made, have had incredible success in the metaverse on their own. And then through this platform, we're able to show to show them to the world and say, these are people who by themselves were able to get themselves from zero to 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 an incredible success in the space. Uh, now it's time for you to invest um, again, like um, in uh, in traditional NFT parlance, <laughs> we are going to make it is uh, one of the biggest sort of acronyms we use. Um, and I think that's the whole that's the whole point of uh, that's the biggest utility for us is to be able to to come up together and make it quote unquote together. Uh, find that prosperity and that success through mutualism and collaboration. Yeah, so we're running out of time, but just to before we close, um, I would also like to ask all the speakers, how do you foresee the future of the arts and cultural landscape within the digital realm? Um, Vinay? I've, I think the way we, we share ideas is fundamentally changing. Um, the mobility, um, the mobility of ideas that NFTs give us is is fascinating. In that, suddenly it's no long it's no longer an image that's on my Instagram feed. It's an image that might be housed on Instagram today, but tomorrow might be in Dafa, and then the day after that could be on a gallery in the metaverse. It's it's way more about the creation rather than the context of the creation. And I think that's, that's that sort of direct uh, channel uh, from people that are engaging or fans to the creation, it removes, all the, it removes all the other fluff. It's really just about, are you connected to this idea? Do you align on those shared values? Like, do you, mm. do you align to that? And that's it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, I think the big shift we're going to see is rather than the institutions deciding what makes unity that will shape what ultimately becomes mainstream or can become mainstream, because all you need to do is just find your people, and then that's it. And that's what in essence, like creation should just be about, right? Mm. Um, and yeah, that's yeah. And Linda? No, I think Vinay said it perfectly. Jillian? <laughs> 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 oh, I, I completely agree. I think through my last year of finding, you know, like trying to do DAFA in, in Hong Kong, one thing I really learned um, after, especially after this, is, is um, how humans' connection is going to change massively um, with technology, especially blockchain and NFT. Um, the way that we communicate is, is changing massively. The way that people um, selling art, artists selling art, creative industry, film, music, mm. we're all changing the way that we communicate, not just because of WhatsApp or, or any way of communicating or even investing, buying things, purchasing, um, joining a DAO, joining a Discord. These are going about to change massively and that's, that's what I think is going to happen in the next couple of years. So yeah, that's just, just what my take from this conversation here. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. So thank you everyone for joining today's panel and thank you Linda, Finney and Gillian for sharing on your thank thoughts. You so so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.